faith or favor? That is the question that we want to answer in this study today. But before we go and get into it, we first want to invite you to have a word of prayer with us that the Lord will speak to us. And you'll find that prayer in Psalm 25, verse 5. If you'd like to read or say it with me in faith. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the question that we want to deal with in this study is the issue of the idea of the favor of the Lord. Uh, we see it in different um, books. We see it at different events. We even see it in a favor box that you can purchase or that you can get and you put things in there. And apparently this in Jesus name uh, will have favor on it because you put it in this box. But the question that we really want to answer is, should we be focused on seeking God's favor? Well, the first uh, way to really deal with that question is to understand what is favor? What exactly is it? Well, if you look at the word favor today, as we would say it in English, it's spelled a bit differently than what you find in Scripture. In Scripture, in the Bible, the King, King James Version Bible, it's F-A-V-O-U-R. And that word favor appears over 70 times in the Bible. And it actually comes from the Hebrew word that would be pronounced Cain. And that word Cain basically means to be pleasing or approved. Some other English equivalents that are used of that word throughout the Bible include grace, acceptance, will, desire, pleasure. These are the ideas of favor. So as far as what we're trying to understand, looking at favor, we're going to simply understand it as being the blessing or approval or grace or acceptance. Okay. Now here's a fact. When you look in the Bible, the idea of favor can be granted from one person to another. Some examples of that. you look in the Bible in Esther chapter two, verse 17, it says, and the king loved Esther above all the women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the other virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. In Nehemiah chapter two, verse five, it says, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 22, and Saul sent to Jesse, saying, let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. So here you see favor between the king and his subjects or even favor between individuals in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2 verse 44 it says, And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, this being the early church, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Here, the people of God had favor even with those who were outside of the church because their life was having such a powerful impact. Jesus had just been resurrected. He just went to glory, and the people were on fire for the Lord. And in fact, speaking of the Lord, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus himself, it says, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So it's possible to have favor extended from an individual to another individual. But there's a word of warning or a word of caution. When you look in the Bible in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30 says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So the idea of favor from one to another, we got to be careful because just as quickly as someone can love you, they can also leave you. But Unfortunately, that's how we are with one another. But again, should we be focused on seeking God's favor? Well, the truth is, there are not many examples of people in the Bible seeking God's favor, the explicit request for his favor. Now, I know the instance that will probably pop into some of you all's mind is what about the prayer of Jabez? The prayer of Jabez, the idea and the story was a real popular story a, a few years ago. And it really was used as the basis for the idea of going to God to, quote, get your blessing. 
when you read in first Chronicles chapter four, verse 10, the Bible says Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that thou wouldest blessed me indeed and enlarge my coast and that thine hand might be with me and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. This is a true story and it happened and it's a wonderful and amazing story to build our faith. However, this is one instance of someone going to request something or uh, some kind of physical blessing. But at the same time, if you look closely at the verse, he also asked so that he would keep me from evil. So it really was beyond something material, but a lot of people use this as the basis for what some even call a prosperity gospel. Well, we have to be careful here because anytime someone takes a single verse and uses that to establish an entire idea of philosophy or doctrine, you have to be careful. Think of it this way. You can make a table and a table could have one leg. It could stand on that one leg. But in reality, how stable would that table be? How much could you put on that table? How much weight can it hold? That's why when normally we go to purchase or if we even want to go and make a table, we'll put four legs on it. Because with four legs, you've got stability. You have increased strength because all that weight is being displaced or spread out amongst four legs. And you should have the same approach with making a table as you do with establishing a doctrine. You want to find several verses that support. In fact, not just several. You want to find as many as possible to support the truth that you're arriving to so that you'll know that this is not just someone's interpretation, but this is the explicit will of God. So let's do this as we are trying to understand, should we be seeking God's faith or favor? Because when you look in Psalm 119, verse 58, there's another instance of a request for favor. It says, I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. Now, looking at this text alone, this one leg, it would appear that, oh, OK, here you go again. We can go to God and get what we want when we want it. But look at the entire verse in its context. The verse is in front of it and behind it. And verse 57 of Psalm 119, it says, thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. So in other words, verse 57 is talking about obedience. Then when you go to verse 59, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. So verse 59 is talking about repentance. So if you were to break this, this little pericope or section of scripture down, verse 58, it does appear there's a request for favor. But that may be the meat of the sandwich, but the two slices of bread on the end, on one hand, you've got obedience, and on the other, you have repentance. Those together, those combined, create an environment where the favor of God, it's not just something that you can ask, but it's something you can count on. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's look at that term, favor of the Lord. The fact is that term, the favor of the Lord, actually appears three times in the Bible, as it's written in the King James Version. Let's look at them real quick. The first instance of that term, favor of the Lord, Proverbs chapter eight, verse 35. It says, for whoso findeth me, findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Who is the me in here? The me is not dealing so much with God explicitly, but it's talking about wisdom. The whole chapter is dealing with wisdom. So as we read that, whoever finds wisdom finds life and then shall obtain favor of the Lord. So this is equating wisdom with favor. Don't forget that. You're going to see a twist of this a little bit down the road in the study. But let's look at the other instance in Proverbs 18, verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So here we see the favor of the Lord being equated to finding a godly wife. Having been married for 15 years now, I can testify to this, that there is nothing like knowing that you are with the person that God not just has given you, but the person that he made you for. And in having that relationship and having that experience, it's truly like having God in the flesh in your life. And, and I thank God for my wife and for I hope and I pray that I can be and I am that her in her life as well. So here we see favor being equated to receiving the spouse that God has for us. But then look at Proverbs chapter 12, chapter 12, verse two. It says a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. So in each of these instances where the term the favor of the Lord is written, they are not dealing with material things. One instance is talking about wisdom. The next one's dealing with a wife. 
And the third one is dealing with being good. The idea of righteousness being equated with favor. So when we look at these three verses together, who are some good men uh, of scripture that we can really focus on, like from Proverbs chapter 12, to understand the concept of godly favor? Well, when you go to Genesis 39, verse 21, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So here we see Joseph receiving favor. Then in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, and the child Samuel grew on and was in favor, both with the Lord and also with men. That sounds very similar to the words of Luke chapter 2, where it talks about how Jesus had favor with God and man. Well, when you get to Exodus chapter 11, verse 3, it says the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, even in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So you have three examples. You have Joseph, you have Samuel, you have Moses, and even the people of God receiving favor. But there's no reference to a material good, to something that you hold in your hand. It's something way more powerful than that. Because when you look at these three, just these three examples, what do these men of favor have in common? You'll find all of them in Hebrews chapter 11. Specifically around verse 22, the Bible says, By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And then skipping down to verse 32, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. The truth is these favored good men are known for their faithfulness to God more than having God's favor. And the favor that they had was built on their faith in God. It was built on a relationship with him. And it wasn't about what they had. It was more about through Jesus who they were. That's why when you read in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And if you know, Jesus was not a rich man, not in birth, not in childhood, not in life, and certainly not in death. But he had favor so much with both God and man. Why is that? Why was he able? Why were Joseph and Samuel and all these Moses? Why are others godly even pe people today? Why or how can we receive the favor? It says in verse 12 of Psalm 5, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him as with the shield? Psalm 106, verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation. Proverbs chapter three, verse three says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man, rather in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Verse Proverbs 12, verse two, a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. Proverbs 13, 15, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. And again, fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous, there is favor. All of these verses have favor, but they're dealing with or equating favor in one verse is talking about the salvation of the Lord. In another one, it's talking about understanding. In another one, it's talking about goodness. In another, it's talking about righteousness. In another one, it's talking about the idea of these are true signs. These are true revelations. These are the experiences of being in favor. In fact, the currency of favor is more than, than something material. It's actually something spiritual. So when you read Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, when you see a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor, favor rather than silver and gold. So it doesn't link the two. It's saying favor instead of 
silver and gold. Hmm. So if this is the case with all of these legs of scripture, if you will, the fact is that more often than not, favor, unfortunately, has just become baptized greed. It's the idea of taking God and rather than becoming a part of him, it's using him for our own sake. So it's no surprise that you see the idea of being able to activate God's favor. It's like you can turn God's favor off or turn it on uh, based on something you do or, or or some kind of, I don't know, some 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 something you do to turn it on or off that will open up um, or make God do what you want him to do. Um, let's look at some other ideas that some others have have put to the fore. When you look at Joe Osteen Ministries, he, he makes a quote here, release your faith. God is shifting things in your favor. He's moving the wrong people out and the right people in. So the focus here on this, this quote is that God shifts things in your favor. And remember, another word or another English word to equate favor is will. So basically, God shifts things into your will. Well, look at another quote. It says, uh, God is moving behind the scenes, arraigning things in your favor. He's making a way when you don't see a way. Now, that's true. That last part, God does make a way where there is no way. But the idea of him arranging things in your favor, in other words, because what you might desire, I don't know if that's scriptural. Because when you have that mindset, you see, it's very easy to start just saying to yourself, I'm walking in God's favor. And here you got this illustration of somebody, you know, walking in God's favor. Um, but I don't know if those shoes are consistent with that idea that's trying to be presented. The idea of the favor of God, where, yes, we see in Proverbs, a good man obtaineth uh, favor of the Lord. But again, it takes that verse and rather than presenting what was presented in the original verse of a godly spouse, now we have a crown, um, a throne, the idea of power for you uh, from God. Some have even taken it to say nothing attracts the favor of God like the unfairness of man. That's why a lot of times when you see, see these um, shallow concepts of favor, people are, are focused and talking about people mistreating you. Um, people say you wouldn't be nothing or people said you wouldn't do it. It focuses on people against you when the Bible is focused on the great controversy between good and evil. And we take sides in that controversy. Last quote here, someone else said, other people may have more talent or experience, but God's favor can cause you to go places you could not go on your own. Yes, God will open the door for you. But again, the idea of focusing it on other people and that, in fact, your success is built on their expense. That's not something that we strive to do. We don't strive to put people down as a way to get back to show them something. Um, I don't see how that's that's actually the idea. See, the truth is there's a difference between God doing something for you versus God doing something in you. These last few quotes that we've looked at from others uh, and their their ideas of, of God's favor. It's about God doing something for you. But when you look at the scriptures that we looked at and the different stories and the different examples in Psalms and Proverbs, favor was dealing with God doing something in those people, in the individual to change their character. So, yes, God does something for everyone, but that's not a sign of favor. In fact, Matthew 5, 45, Jesus himself said that ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And so this verse is what keeps us clear of the trap of if you're blessed, then you must be doing something right. If you're not blessed or struggling, then you must not be in God's favor. It's it's taking the material out of the picture to realize that God, who is a God of love, wants all people, even bad people to have rain. He wants even bad people to have the sunlight. God loves all of his children. It's we who each make a decision as to whether or not we want to return that love. But again, the idea of God doing something for you, you can run away with that. You can run away as far as Ben Franklin did. He has a quote where he says that beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. So you see how far along that idea can go. But even though Ben Franklin's uh, concept here, which goes back, 
this idea of God doing something or a God doing something for you is pretty ancient. In the movie that was recently released, the series of movies made from the book, The Hunger Games, in the, in the movie, there's a character. Uh, I believe her name is Effie Trinket. And the character in the movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm one of those two. I've never seen it. But from what I understand, it's a movie that illustrates young people in this uh, sometime in the future who have to go and fight for their food, for their family or fight for survival. They're teenagers um, and they have to do go through these games where it's to the death to survive. And if they win, they get the rewards. If not, then obviously um, it doesn't turn out the way they want it. So in in the movie, this character, she says something over the 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 to the, the contestants before they go out. And she says, may the odds be ever in your favor. In other words, she's wishing or hoping that the odds would be in their favor when they go out to, uh, to battle. But it's interesting that that will be said because if you just take one of those words, you'll see that that idea is a lot older than we may even know. Instead of may the odds be ever in your favor, perhaps the idea really is may the favor of the gods be with you or may the odds or may the gods be in your favor this egyptian pagan ideal shows itself throughout history uh, beginning here at that time but even carrying even through to greco-roman culture where in greece you have one of the goddess or goddesses was uh fortuna and fortuna was a goddess who basically was the goddess of fortune or favor or luck and so people would pray to her to receive good fortune or fortuna. And you see her holding uh, the horn of plenty on one hand. And the other hand, she has what looks like a plow. So fortune for the harvest, fortune for your planting uh, to grow and to prosper. Because most people in that day, their finances or wealth was, was tied up in agricultural assets. So when you see in Greek culture, it carries over into Roman culture. And you see this combination between the, the two goddesses. One of the goddesses being Fortuna, the other being Isis. So here you see a statue of an, an Isis Fortuna goddess. Again, pray to that the God's favor would be upon you or that God would be behind you instead of standing before you. So as old as this idea is, this stuff is not going away. There's actually a martini or not martini, uh, a tequila, a Mexican tequila called Fortuna. And here you see the ad where this uh, tequila maker, they actually have these gatherings where they have these cocktail contests where, you know, obviously the people for the contestants have to use Fortuna um, tequila to make their cocktail. And it's actually called the fortune teller. And you see the logo there, very similar to the wheel that we saw on the Fortuna goddess or Isis Fortuna goddess that she held. In another ad from Fortuna, in fact, on the, 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 the tequila's website, you'll see there you have the Fortuna logo, the Fortuna Mezcal. But notice this little subheading down below. Fortuna, pure wisdom. Remember, we looked at a lot of verses in Proverbs where it equated fortune with wisdom. That's why even on this uh, flyer, this uh, marketing brochure for the, the tequila, it says champagne is for the rich. Fortuna is for the wise. Take note also of the all seeing eye down on below. So there's a spiritual component to the idea of fortune or luck where I'm wanting this God or goddess to work in my favor. And so to, to secure that favor, there's certain things that I have to do. So we see the idea of being born all the way from Egyptology through Greek and Roman paganism, even Look at this picture here from World War II. One of the, the things that became notable back in that time was to, to actually name your plane. And, and here we have a, a photo of a B-52 bomber and they're painted on the side of the plane is Lady Luck. And you see a, a woman's face on a four leaf clover and Lady Luck on the side. So that's why it's not a surprise that when you look even today from advertisements for alcohol to advertisements for gambling establishments, even in modern cinema and movies, it's not just something on the side. It's highlighted in, I believe, the 1950s uh, play that became a movie, Guys and Dolls, Marlon Brando, Frank Sinatra. They both uh, acted along with two other ladies in the picture. And there you see um, the illustration of Lady Luck there. Um, notice the similarities, again, 
between the goddesses and even to the modern day references. Frank Sinatra sang a song and probably the, the most notable song of that movie and one of his um, most popular songs is Luck Be a Lady. And if you look at the lyrics of the song, look at what the song actually is. They call you Lady Luck, but there is room for doubt. At times you have a very unladylike way of running out. You're on this date with me. The pickings have been lush. And yet before the evening is over, you might give me the brush. You might forget your manners. You might refuse to stay. And so the best that I can do is pray. Luck be a lady tonight. So this song is actually a prayer to Lady Luck that she would grant favor while he's going out to hit the streets. Well, the real fact of the matter is, is that favor comes from faithfulness, not Fortuna, not a lady, not luck. When you look at the story of 1 Kings chapter 18, probably one of the greatest illustrations of this on Mount Carmel, it was here that Israel had forsaken God. And instead of choosing the one true God, they've gone after many gods. And, and one of those chief false gods was Baal, brought in by um, Jezebel in her marriage to King Ahab. And so God raised up a prophet to bring the people of God back to a devotion to him and faithfulness rather than seeking simple favor. And so finally things came to a head and there was going to be a challenge between the two gods. And Elijah proposed that they would build altars. And if whoever's God was true would be the God who would send fire to an altar where there was no fire. And so this was going to take a supernatural intervention, which would prove to the people who was true. So Elijah proposes in first Kings 18, call you on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> Many gods versus one Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For ye are many and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. So you have 450 prophets of Baal putting together their altar, preparing this sacrifice. They took the Baal, rather they took the bullock which was given them in verse 26. They dressed it, called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So you see an escalation. They go from screaming, crying out, to now they don't hear anything, the physicalities. They start jumping. They start dancing. They get on the altar itself to bring the fire. And it came to pass around noon in verse 27 that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is talking or he's pursuing or he's on a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and he has to be awake. And they cried aloud and now they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances. Now, we know these aren't any small nicks or, or scratches that you get from a razor or from shaving because the Bible says they cut themselves deep until the blood gushed out upon them so they're cutting arteries at this point but it came to pass when midday was passed and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded these folks carried on from morning almost until night and there was no response because God was trying to show that it was not the blood of bulls it wasn't even their own blood. It was the blood of the promised Savior was the only way that they could secure and ensure not just the power of God, but the presence of God, the relationship with him. So now after they carried on, we see here Elijah calls on some folks to take stones. They took specifically 12 stones, one for each tribe that God valued and he loved and he cared for. And he put those stones together and they put, the Bible says in verse 36, that it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah came near. And after they had put the sacrifice upon this altar, all he did, he says, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, 
Hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Do you remember the verse, the sandwich in Psalm 119, where you had favor? On one hand, you have obedience. On the other hand, you have repentance. Verse 36, it's talking about obeying, doing the word of the Lord. Verse 37, that the people will turn back again. Repentance obedience and repentance if you were to time how long it took for you to read verses 36 and 37 i guarantee you it would not take as long from sunrise to sunset because by the time you get to verse 38 the bible says then the fire of the lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice now how do we know this wasn't just some stray <laughs> ember from i don't know somebody's lantern or that this was something that somebody would might call luck the bible says it consumed the burnt sacrifice, the animal. It consumed the wood, which was supposed to burn. But, oh, and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Because he had them pour water on the, the altar before the fire consumed it. Friends, when all the people saw it, and I hope when you see this, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the the God, the Lord, he is the God. <laughs> God is good. And this story shows us when it comes to faith versus favor, the truth is you overwhelmingly more often see God seeking our faithfulness to his faithfulness. See, God is faithful. When you read Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And verse five of Psalm 89, the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Psalm 119, 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted us. God is so faithful that even in his affliction in other words when he leaves us to ourselves and we find ourselves in a mess even then god is still faithful god is still committed to redeeming and putting us in the right way psalm 89 verse 1 says i will sing of the mercies of the lord forever with my mouth will i make known thy faithfulness to all generations there's a song even that's based on lamentations 3 verse 23 the Bible says they are new. God's mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is God's faithfulness. The song even says, great is thy faithfulness. O God, my father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not as thou hast been. Thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. God is faithful to pardon our sin and give a peace that endureth. Thine own dear pleasure to cheer, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with 10,000 beside friends when we think about faith versus favor i would encourage us to seek faith in the lord if we are faithful to god if we are committed to him to a love relationship not a works relationship not a a what can i get relationship but instead any good relationship is entered him with the idea of what can I give to this relationship? If we do that, I guarantee you we'll find ourselves walking in the favor of the Lord. So in conclusion, do God a favor. Be faithful. And leave the favor to the faithful God.